Hi, this is Tom Cook, and you're listening to the FSF Popcast. The show that is forever worried that the erasers of our animator friends will one day be pointed our way. We're surprised it hasn't happened yet, if we're being honest. Our show is brought to you by our charity sponsor, the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund, which supports the Wish Upon a Teen Foundation that helps out sick kids when they need it most. And just imagine the comfort you'll give Red Shirt Crewman number 1981. He'll know that when he puts on the red shirt and joins the crew of the Enterprise in their struggle against Skeletor and his henchmen, he didn't leave his family destitute without hope. Because the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund has his back and what's left of the Power Sword. All right, guys, we are so happy to welcome a renowned animator, director, and producer of animation. You've seen his work on He-Man, uh, She-Ra, Scooby-Doo, Brave Star, uh, one of my all-time favorites, Thundar the Barbarian. If you've slept on Thundar the Barbarian growing up, go back and watch it. It's an amazing Hanna-Barbera uh, production and lots and lots of fun. Uh, so, kids and cadets, we are excited to welcome Thomas Cook to the FSF Podcast. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're all we're excited. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a whole lot excited. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I uh, we, we So we met Tom at the Monroe Pop Fest in Monroe, Michigan, back this past September. And so Tom and I have been Facebook friends for a while, but it was our first chance meeting in person. And I was pretty excited to meet him in person because it's safe to say that he's responsible in, a, in, a, in one way or another for a large portion of the awesomeness that was my childhood when it came to animated shows. You know, we talked about some of the things in the title, uh, the entrance, uh, the introduction. I'll get it right sooner or later, maybe, kind of, sort of. Um, I'm not going to yeah. criticize. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> I, I, I can't take it. No. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, there was all the shows that we mentioned there. And I remember watching a lot of the Hanna-Barbera era shows and, and just absolutely loving them. And I thought uh, Thunder the Barbarian was great. It, I, it was a great show. I really, really enjoyed it. So thank you, first and uh, foremost, before we get into anything else in the show, thank you for helping making my childhood so awesome and having these great shows to watch. And I know that you were uh, a part of those in one way or another, whether you were an animator yeah. or, or, or whatever else it was. I do hear that a lot. The word childhood comes up all the time. And uh you know, I had a childhood, too, and my childhood was filled with Saturday morning cartoons as well. So I definitely understand where you're coming from because I lived that same that same thing as a kid. Awesome. So that actually actually perfectly leads me into my, my question. So thank you. Um, I, I, I really like to know what makes people tick, you know, how they got to where they are, who how they became who they are and all these different things. So in, in your younger years, Tom, what are the things that influenced you? What were the influences around you that pointed you towards a career in the arts, made you want to be an artist? Boy, you know, um, I never, ever wanted to be an artist. It all kind of happened accidentally. But what really got me going, because I always drew as a kid, you know, in fifth grade, we had this little cartoon club and there were like two or three of us that would get together and we'd just draw little teeny, like sort of panel cartoons, you know, the like little gag at the end. And um, so I love doing that. But then I also, I also was a big comic book reader. So I used to read a lot of, in the 50s, because I grew up, I started, uh, I started life in 1952. And, uh, so really, what was around for me to, to read was Batman and Superman, Wonder mm -hmm. Woman. Uh, Justice League wasn't even around yet. And Marvel was timely, and we never really got any of those comics at our store. So I was really unaware of timely at all. And But around 1961, um, so I'm about nine years old, uh, Marvel Comics started. And me and my friend, my next door neighbor, another Tom, he uh, he and I were kind of camping out in the backyard with our tent into the woods. And, you know, we could still see the house, but we felt like we were out in the wild. Uh, we'd sit there at night reading comic books with our flashlights. Uh, and uh, he pulled out 
Excelsior. Amazing Spider-Man number one. No, actually, it was number three. My daughter just shut that off. So anyway, so we were in the backyard reading comic books, and he pulls out Amazing Spider-Man number four, which was uh, the appearance of Sandman. Okay. And I just kind of looked at it, and I thought, wow, this is like, you know, DC comic covers didn't look like this. This was just different. And so I really loved it, and I traded him, like, a lot of comics for that one comic. Um, and that's kind of what got me going with Steve Ditko and Spider-Man. And then, okay. you know, I fell, I fell in line and started, you know, I found out about Fantastic Four. Then the, the Avengers came along, then X-Men. So that's kind of where I started getting excited about learning to draw, was I would have my comic book, and I would find a really good pose that Steve Ditko did, and I would kind of do my version of it. And that's kind of how I learned a little bit of anatomy and stuff like that. And eventually you start drawing your own poses. And so that's kind of how I got started. But really, it was thanks to uh, Spider-Man. And of course, I uh, luckily got to meet Steve Ditko. I went down oh, to New cool. York. I was at a New York Comic Con. And I went to his office, and I kind of ambushed him coming out of the uh, elevator. And But I just wanted to thank him for, like, inspiring me to this great career that I had. And he was really nice because, you know, I was nervous as a cat because I figured, is he going to get real mad at me for stopping him? And I don't want my hero mad at me, you know. But he was very nice, mm -hmm. shook my hand, and he was going out to breakfast. And I said, could I buy you breakfast? And he said, well, nope. And then he just walked off. But uh, – it still was a big, a big moment in my life to finally meet my big hero that I thought I'd never get to meet. That's very cool. Yeah, I, I think always meeting heroes is, is uh, it's kind of trepidatious because you know you're, there's the nervousness of of meeting them. Yeah. And you know, i uh, wanting to make sure that you don't put your you know your foot in your mouth or or at least you, at least if you do that, I hope the, the foot at least tastes decent because. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, well, and you're uh, hoping you don't, you don't, you're hoping number one that they're nice, right? I mean, it'd be nothing worse than, than you know, bumping, you know, going in meetings to him and having him, you know, get really mad at me. And it's like, gosh, that would just crush me, you know, as a, right. as a big fan. And uh, so, I, and I've had some moments of that meeting some of my heroes where it didn't work as good as I was hoping, you know, nothing mm -hmm. really bad, just not sure. as good as I was. Okay. Yeah, I've been fortunate in that regard. The, the couple of people who were, I very much looked up to somebody and wanted to go meet them. I've had good, positive interchanges with them. Or they, like for me, the, one of the most recent ones is um, I, I'm a huge hockey fan, mm -hmm. Detroit Red Wings, and uh, got an opportunity a couple years back to meet Darren McCarty, and he was just as nice as could be. He's my favorite hockey player. Uh, loved him when he was on the wings and, you know, uh, got really nervous to meet him and, but yeah, couldn't, it couldn't have been any nicer and he was a great interview as well. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah. I had that same thing with, uh, meeting my, really my childhood hero who was Mickey Mantle and, oh, uh, boy. he was at a, yeah, he was at a local show doing some autographing and, uh, well, I put on my Yankee Jersey the mantle on the back, you know, nice. took my book through my and, and had him sign everything for me. And uh, again, he was super nice. And, and in fact, he really wasn't taking photographs, but he was getting up just to go to lunch. And I kind of said, you know, can I get a photo with you? He, yeah, sure. So he comes over, puts his arm around me. And, and uh, so it was a real good moment, you know. Oh, and, cool. Uh, yeah. Oh, goodness. So those moments make me think too about when when those of us who go to cons when we get to meet our heroes at cons and honestly your career has that really cool perk where you're one of the people people want to go to cons to meet and you go to so many conventions every year which i think is amazing but what do you personally enjoy the most about attending these conventions you know really it's it's meeting the fans because the fans like i said earlier that's me. You know, I was the same thing as a kid, and I never had a chance to go meet Bob Clampett 
or Dawes Butler, the voice of Huckleberry Hound and Yogi Bear and mm -hmm. Elroy, man, I would have, I would have killed to be able to meet those people, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, so, number one, I get to travel a lot, and uh, just meeting the fans is just is the best part because I realize that's me on the other side of the table meeting my fan, my favorite person. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's just, uh, it's just real special. And, you know, I'm retired, so I don't really have anything to do. So going out away on the weekend is really fun. Uh, I'm a big baseball fan. So if I ever go to a, a con in the city that's got a baseball team, I'll plan to come a day early and go see a ball game. And I, I've had twice when I went to uh, New York for the New York City Comic Con, the wild card game was the same night that I flew in. So I got tickets and went to the wild card game with like the Astros and the Yankees and Oakland and the Yankees one time. So that's an oh, awesome cool. perk too, you know. That is a cool perk. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hey, if you're going to travel, you might as well have some extra fun with it. I, I would do the same thing if it were hockey. So, you know, I'd be going around yep. and checking out all the hockey barns. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you know, we talked about me. We talked about meeting fans. And, and so um, like with my daughter, we she met you at, at Monroe. And, and by the way, you couldn't have been nicer to her. Thank you so much for that. She was so excited. She loves she -Ra. I mean, like loves she mm -hmm. Um And I remember uh, when we were at Monroe, I told her, I'm like, uh, you know, so the guy from she he's right over there. <laughs> and she's like, oh, my God, where? <laughs> <laughs> she had almost gotten her breath back by the time that she found you. So, uh, but you were really cool. You, uh, It was very nice of you to take that picture with her. And it, yeah, she's, uh, we're framing that picture. She was very excited about it, by the way. Very nice. So, yeah. So thank you very much for that. Um, and that's what yeah, I like, like to, said, I like yeah. to hear, you know, is that my whole reason for being there meeting people is not to be a jerk. <laughs> it's to be nice and accommodating <laughs> and, uh, you know, people come up and they want a photo and, you know, some people are charging for photos. And I thought, well, if I charge for photos, nobody will get a photo. <laughs> so I just said, <laughs> uh, I said early on, I'm just going to do, if somebody wants a photo of me, you know, I'll do it. I'll do it for free. Nice. I think that's a cool policy, you know, it, especially for, you know, you know, when the, when the, some of the kids come up or, you know, people who are, you know, yeah, I just think that's really cool. So, all right. Uh, yeah. I, one of the other things I think is cool about your career though, Tom, is that you've had the opportunity to play in, in several different sandboxes. And what I mean by that is that you're not limited to one genre you've done, uh, you know, Scooby-Doo, you've done He-Man, you've done Brave Star, you've done all these different things. Ghostbusters uh, was another one of the ones that you've worked on. And, you know, um, yeah. And there's, and I know Kathleen's got questions about some other things that you've done later on. So I'm not going to steal the thunder on any of that stuff, but. You're not going you, to steal the thunder on any uh -huh. of that Exactly. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, but you've had this opportunity to work in all these different things. But for as many wins as you've had in the pop culture world, how hard was it for you as a young man trying to get your start to learn how to accept a no? Well, you know, it's my my career has been uh, one just based on really good luck. I mean, it really uh, had very little to do with me. It had a lot more with me just being at the right place at the right time. Um, you know, the way I was a, a bus driver, a transit bus driver in Los Angeles. And um, that I didn't want to do that for my career, but it paid really well. You know, I got a lot of hours every week, so I was making pretty good money. And it was the, the first time that I could almost, not quite, but almost afford to buy a house in L.A. I could buy a house elsewhere, but not in Los Angeles. But okay. so, so I was... I enjoyed driving the bus. Uh, the big problem was they made us pick people up. And that kind of that kind of ruined the whole thing because it was really yeah. difficult. You know, people were really difficult to deal with. So, but Yeah, what, that hasn't changed. So. so what happened is 
you know, I've told this story a million times, but it just bears repeating because it's just so amazing to me. So I believe it was my day off and I went out to the mailbox at my apartment to get my mail and it was just a bunch of junk mail. And normally I come in the door and I just throw it in the trash. Well, today, for some reason, or that day, for some reason, I just threw it on the kitchen table. And, um, you know, I went over and made a sandwich and sat down to eat it. And I noticed this little pamphlet that came in the mail. And I don't like to just sit there and not do something. So if I've got a newspaper or whatever, a comic, anything, I'll just sit and read while I'm eating. So I grabbed this pamphlet, and it was uh, Cal State Northridge, which is the local college uh, down there in L.A., um, mm -hmm. it was their summer schedule for classes they were going to hold during the summer extension courses. And so I'm flipping through it and I have no, I'm not going to go to college, but I'm, I might as well see what they, they're offering. And I see this comic book class and I'm thinking, what the heck is this? So I'm reading through the, the description and they're basically going to get together and everybody's going to create a comic book do all the penciling and inking, creating the characters and everything, write the story, and that's gonna be the class. So I thought, wow, that sounds like a lot of fun. And since it's only one day a week, I can work my schedule because I always had split days off. I had like either Tuesday and Thursday or Monday and Wednesday. You could never get two days off in a row, which I couldn't understand mm -hmm. why, but that's the way it was. So I, I could, get myself to have Tuesday and Thursdays off. And then Tuesday was the class uh, in the evening because I never could have made it. Uh, we worked too late every night. I never could have made it to the class. So I just decided to do that. And the teacher was a guy named Don Rico. And Don Rico, I knew from comic book, my comic book fandom, that he did Captain America back in the 50s. And he did some of the Daredevil back in the 50s half red oh wow okay. black so that made it even more important that i wanted to take this class because i'd finally meet a real comic book artist. and um you know i i never really wanted to be a comic book artist thought boy i wish i could but i didn't really think i ever could and but this will be okay. the next closest thing so anyway so i took the class and the first day of the class he said next week i want everybody to bring their portfolios in and, and while you guys are doing whatever you're doing, I'll go through all your portfolios and give you some tips and, and stuff like that at the end of the class. So that happens. I bring my portfolio. And as we're getting ready to leave, uh, Don says, hey, Tom, could I talk to you for a second? And I'm thinking like, you know, what the heck have I done wrong already? You know, it's day, day two of the class. <laughs> and he said, uh, I work at Hanna-Barbera as a storyboard artist. And all of your drawings were all superheroes. And we're doing Super Friends, Challenge of the Super Friends. So, you, you know, we're doing Batman, Superman, all these characters that you can draw mm -hmm. really well. And we have a lot of animators that are really good at Fred and Barney and Scooby-Doo, but they kind of struggle with the human figures. How would you like it if I recommend you to a class that they teach at Hanna Barbera that's free if you're recommended by one of the members? And uh, and I said, Are you kidding me? Of course, I'd love to do that. You know, so so I got to go in to uh, meet the guy that was running the class, and he's looking through my portfolio, and this is a couple, maybe five or six days later, and he gets on the phone. And in walks Joe Barbera, and they're kind of looking through my portfolio, and they said, you know, we would hire you right now, except we have no room. All of our desks are full, but we'll put you in the class, and they usually, you know, will hire out of the class if we find good students, and that would be your break. And, and I said, well, that'd be unbelievable, you know. So I took the class, I did three weeks of the class, didn't really do very well because I really don't know much about animation and I'm doing my in-between and I'm trying to draw my hands all shaky mm -hmm. and the in-between didn't look very good. But on the third week, they announced they're going to hire four of us and I was one of the ones that they were going to hire. And so I told the director, I said, look, I, I really 
I'm not ready. I don't know what I'm doing yet. And he said, don't worry about it. You're going to be sitting with an animator. You'll be as so I was an assistant animator. And you'll learn through him how to do this. And so that's how I got my job. I mean, I never applied for a job to work at Anna Barbera. I just got it. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. That's awesome, though. That's a great way. That's a, that's a great way to get a job. Yeah, that's why the luck thing. Like I'm telling you, if I threw that junk mail away, yeah. I'm gonna bust. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't be here. That's for sure. Yeah, that's very cool. Goodness, that okay. is really cool. <laughs> That is really well, cool. that kind of it, it's cool. It shatters my question, but it's really cool. I like that. Uh, <laughs> so let me let me ask this as a secondary. OK, so you worked on all these different projects. Was there a project that didn't make the cut that didn't make it to air that you thought w was going to have a possibility like, you you know, like there's TV shows that get pilots. Was there ones that you drew concept art for that you thought had an opportunity to do something and didn't? No, because usually everything is broken down where you've got, you know, writers, you've got storyboard, you've got voice artists, you've got layout, you've got animators, you've got assistant animators, you've got ink and paint, you've got cameramen. So all of that is all done in time. So by the time it gets to me, it's already a TV show. They're not going to animate it. Fair enough. Unless it's going to be a TV show. Uh, they might do something. Uh, I never worked on anything like this, but there might be something that that they would do to kind of pitch to the networks. Uh, you know, a, a quick couple of scenes, just an example of what it would look like. But I, I'd never been involved in anything like that before. Usually they pitch the show. The network says thumbs up, thumbs down. And then if it's a thumbs up, they just start writing it and we just start working on it. The only thing that ever didn't hit the airwaves was right at the very end, we were doing a sequel to Brave Star that was called Bravo, that was all the little prairie people, so it was based okay. on them. And another show called Bugsburg, which was a bunch of bugs from the uh, Pinocchio movie that we did. Mm -hmm. And we had two or three episodes done when L'Oreal came in, promised they would keep the studio open, bought the studio, and then promptly closed the mm. studio. Ah, okay. So those three episodes never saw, saw air. I don't even think they got much past the animation stage. Okay. Um, I don't even think they, they got painted. Hmm. Okay, so they're early on in animation. Okay. Yeah. Oh, All right, fair enough. So through all of the projects that you've worked on, so many of those beloved characters have now been turned into action figures and collectibles. And I read in another interview, and I can see behind you, you have a pretty incredible yeah. collection of your own. Mm -hmm. So I actually, yeah. I have a two-part question on collectibles as well. So how does it feel knowing that these characters that you helped bring to life are now collector's items, that they're cherished items for other people? It's, it's just, uh, it's impossible to grasp the fact that I've, I've been this fortunate to... I mean, I can remember sitting there, you know, I'm drawing Batman for the Super Friends show. I'm going, I'm thinking to myself, I'm drawing Batman <laughs> professionally, and this is going to be on TV. I just couldn't believe it, you know. So I realized what I was doing, but it was just so like an out-of-body experience that what I was drawing was going to end up being on TV, Uh that it was mind blowing, you know, it just really, of course I love it. I mean, it was just so, it's so gratifying to know that He-Man was probably the biggest cartoon hit, you know, like in history. I mean, it, it sold like a billion dollars worth of toys in almost no time. Mm -hmm. And, and it was one of the few things that I worked on that when I would go out to dinner with my friends and stuff like that, or even people that I didn't know, when, when the topic came around to what do you do for a living? They really didn't understand animator until I said the word He-Man. And then they would be, oh, my gosh, my kids love that show. So even people that weren't cartoon people knew about He-Man because all their kids made them buy the toys for Christmas. Right. Mm -hmm. So it really expanded 
the number of people that now understood what an animator was. It's it's kind of like now with, you know, it was, man, in my youth, there were no T-shirts with Spider-Man on it because T-shirts were white. Mm. Mm-hmm. There was no writing on a T-shirt, you know, and here I am. You know, you've got something. I've got Spider-Man on mine. <laughs> um, and everybody's wearing T-shirts with stuff on it. When I was a kid, we didn't have that. And uh, and there were no Comic Cons, and now even parents that know nothing about comic books know about Comic Cons, right? You know, and and people that never were into cartoons now are into cartoons because the internet and everything has just built it up. So it's really become a Comic Con has gone from a a fun little thing with twenty people showing up to you know two hundred thousand people. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Which which is New York, you know, it's just, uh, and they all love it, and I love that they love it because it's it makes the time there so much fun for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, and Ronnie, the kid across the street, got a brand new He Man, Skeletor, and Battle Cat. I was pissed because I <laughs> wanted it, and I didn't have it. <laughs> But you know he had, I mean he were he had the toys. I mean his mom and he, he, yeah, he had all the toys that I wanted to have as a kid. So I was, my mom was always like, "Where are you going? I'm going to Ronnie's. He's got, you know, he had all the cool toys." <laughs> so, yeah. So the only the only follow up to that question that I have is in your incredible collection, do you have a favorite piece? Oh man, <laughs> it's like asking That's for tough, a Yeah, back there you can see I've got most of the stuff I've worked on. In fact, you really can't see it, but let me see if I can get out of the way here. But yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of at the bottom. Let me see if I get my finger pointing the right way. Come on, where are you? Camera, there we are. Right there. That's my animation desk. Okay. Oh, cool. That I worked that I worked on He-Man. Oh. Oh, neat. And then the wooden shelves that are kind of right above the desk, those are the shelves I had in my uh, my cubicle. And then above it is just all shelves that I, uh, I built to hold all my stuff. But, uh, you know, I've got, I've got a lot of things on there because uh, I just loved all the stuff. It's hard. I wish I was a little closer, but I've got, um, like, you heard of Sokies? You know what a Soki is? Yeah, see, look at this. Look at those question marks in your face. So anyway, the Soki is basically a shampoo bottle, but it was shaped like your favorite character. And then you'd, you know, turn the top off and then use the shampoo, and then you would collect okay. them. Now but I know back, what those are. Back, I used back to in there, back up above the, let's see, my right side, I've got, like, the He-Man Soki, the, the uh, Skeletor, uh and the uh, brave, I've got a Brave Star bank. So anytime I saw something that was in a store that I worked on, I usually picked it up. You know, and and over my shoulder here, you can see I've got the Super Friends uh, maquettes. I've got the whole gang of them. Um, I've got even right above my head, I've got Pinky and the Brain, and those are signed by Rob Paulson and and Maurice. Nice. Uh, those are great. One of the one of the biggest things that I I loved myself as a kid was something called Beanie and Cecil. Okay. Do uh-huh. you know what that is? Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really popular cartoon back in the early sixties. Okay. And and you could see I've got a um, let's see over here, right there, that picture right there. Mm-hmm. That is Beanie and Cecil, and it's signed by Bob Clampett, who was the director of all the uh, Looney Tunes, a lot of the Looney Tune cartoons. Yeah. yeah. One of the creators of Bugs Bunny. Um, he had a Beanie and Cecil a puppet show in the fifties that was really popular, and so that's one of the things I love the most in my collection too. Is I got got to meet Bob Clampett, who was my favorite director of all those early Warner Brothers cartoons that I love so much. So that's a big one. And I've also got, I think this this here is an Iron Man that was drawn by George Tuska. I had him do that for a commission for me. Ooh. Nice. And 
but lots of toys, as you can see. It just, uh, those are full. Well, Tim understands having lots of toys. <laughs> Tim and, and if his you toys. saw the front here, if you saw the front in front of me, it's another shelf like the one behind me. And it's got all of the, uh, a lot of the statues from the Marvel collection. Oh, nice. And, uh, a lot of books and other collectibles up there as well. And over against the wall, I've got the full-size He-Man and She-Ra and Skeletor and all the all the uh, statues. Oh, cool! That I saw one on eBay, and I called the company and said, "Do you have any left?" And they said, "You worked on the show." I said, "Yeah." He says, "We're going to send you every one for free." Ah, cool. Oh, how cool is that? Yeah, so, I mean, it just, there are benefits to have worked on the show. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so my whole room is really just solid collectible stuff. In That's this corner, cool. it's all baseball. So I've got my Mickey Mantle baseball bat and autograph stuff for Mickey Mantle. Nice. And so, yes, it's, my wife hates it, but I love it. Well, there's a reason why all this stuff is here. Yeah. Uh, instead of, instead of I at my understand. house. You know, yeah. Uh, I, I have a few things at my house, like at my desk at the house. I've got a few Funko Pops and a few uh, coffee mugs and some collectibles and things that, that I had found over the years. And, and so I have a few things at home, but I had to move it all here because she didn't want me hanging my Red Wings jersey or my Red Wings goalie mask or my Darth Vader masks. And yeah. you know, all that had to come here. So I get it. Silly. Yeah, I, what I did is when we bought this house uh, six years ago, it was... You know, it wasn't built yet, so we just went in and kind of customized it. And what I did is I took our third car garage, and instead of it being garage size, it's like 40 feet long. And that's where I am. I added the air conditioning and heating, like as you can see over here, mm -hmm. and it's carpeted. And this is kind of my man cave. Yeah. Nice. And uh, so this is where I've got a big screen TV over here so I can watch baseball because my wife doesn't like baseball. So I spend a lot of my time out here, you know, doing things. And when we have family over, the guys all congregate out here to watch the football game or whatever while they watch whatever they watch in there. I Fair love enough. It. I think I'd be congregating yeah. there too. I, mm -hmm. As much as I like sports, I'd probably be like, ooh. Yeah, <laughs> but I get it. Uh, all right. So uh, in a more silly vein, have a question for you on this in silliness. So one of the things we like to do when we have somebody come on the show, we always try to make sure that we do our proper amount of research, find out something about them. And I had seen stories uh, about, you know, your, your bus driving days and, and, and some things like that. Uh, but I also couldn't help but notice that there's a large number of Thomas cooks out in the world. Uh, and, <laughs> It was kind of funny. I ran across one that was a preacher. There's an airline called Thomas Cook Airline. There's a travel company. Yeah. There was some railroad dude from the 1800s in the uh, from England. Um, you know, there's a few other Tom Cooks in the entertainment world as well. Yeah. So I don't know. Have you ever tried Googling yourself? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I don't come up first. Right. You know, Thomas Cook, Tom, Thomas Cook Travel Agency is one of the top ones that comes I mean, up. Yeah, and of course they just went, they just went bankrupt. Oh, yeah. I saw that. Yeah, I was I was looking in. I was like Thomas Cook. I was like, what happened to Thomas Cook Travel Agency? I was reading. That, I was like, oh, interesting. Yeah. So exactly. So what's the silliest thing that you've come across associated with your name uh, when doing your own research? Well, I don't know. I don't know if I've seen anything really silly. It's just uh, like you said. It's. You put in a lot of people's names, and that's the only one that comes up. Mm -hmm. So so when I made my Facebook page, I, I made it Tom Cook Animator. So if you put that in Facebook, that pops up. Right. If I put Tom Cook, you just get this endless list. You'd never figure out which one to choose, you know. <laughs> so, um, but I think I think my, my great-grandfather was Thomas Cook. And he was in England oh. in the 1800s. So that, you know, maybe he was a railroad guy. Maybe I don't, he's a railroad know. guy. Yeah, the businessman. Yeah, maybe the Could be. Could be. Because we, we have in my family, um, my dad's name was Walter. He was an airline pilot for TWA. 
And his dad, uh, Chess was like, I think, a shoemaker you know, or a, uh, I don't know what you call that, but cobbler. Yeah, cobbler. You know, whatever yeah. they call him here. In, yeah, and th that's kind of what he did for a living. And uh, and then my grandfather, like I said, was Thomas Cook. And I think both of them were both pretty good artists. And actually, my dad was a fairly good artist, too. Okay. I remember as a kid, he would make me all these characters, and then I would make comic books of his characters that he created. And uh, so, but I, I always got, you know, the, what are you going to do with these stupid cartoons you're drawing all the time? And then I got my job at Hanna-Barbera and I called my dad. I said, hey, dad, guess what? Just got a job at Hanna-Barbera. That's what I'm doing with these stupid cartoons, he, dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he was pretty proud of me. That's awesome. But uh, he, he wanted me to be an airline pilot like he was. And I just didn't want anything to do with that because I wanted to be home with my family for dinner every night. Okay. And he wasn't. And it was, I mean, it, it wasn't a bad childhood. Don't get me wrong. Sure. It was a good childhood. But I did miss my dad not being able to come to all my Little League games. And he could only come to the ones when he was home. Okay. Because he's gone a week at a time, you know. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Round trip lags. Yeah, I get that. But yeah, silly I... stuff. I don't really know anything silly that's come up with my name. Okay. No, I, yeah, I I. I only asked that because, like I said, I was doing the research, and I kept – it was silly to me just because of how many Thomas Cooks I was, I went yeah. through. And and so I, I changed it from Thomas to Tom Cook, and that didn't help anything. Uh, yeah. And even when I went to IMDB to look at your at – your, Yeah, uh, there's your a couple of them. On, there's a couple of them on there, and I had to go to each yeah. one individually to make sure I was I was looking at the right Tom Cook. Um yeah, they had me. They had me listed as Thomas R. Cook, and then for some reason they changed it just to Tom Cook. And then I think it's like Tom Cook number four. Yeah, you know Roman numeral four, right. and that's the one that's me. And it kind of says animation or something next to it, so that it's a little bit easier to find. But for a while it was kind of difficult because there were so many different Thomas Cooks there. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's a whole lot of them out on the interwebs. It's uh, depending on, on, like I said, you could be a preacher. Uh, and you, I think you could, I think you could, uh, pull off a, a mission impossible episode of just, you know, all the different people you could be just by being Tom. Yeah. It could be interesting. So it would be. So Tim had kind of mentioned this earlier, but we, we talked about how, how much of an impact your work has had on, on our childhoods. And I mean, being significantly younger than Tim, I, I don't have, Rude. I don't have it. I don't necessarily have the same connection. <laughs> right, right. I had to make the dig. I'm sorry. I can't. I can't help it. But looking through your incredible list, I got hit with a wave of nostalgia with the Jetsons movie. I oh, yeah. absolutely love that movie. I cannot. I seriously cannot think of the number of times I watched it growing up. And the little grungies are just like they're my favorite, and I love them. And I, I was looking at pictures of them again today, and I'm like, oh man, I need to watch the movie again. I should watch the movie with my daughter. She hasn't seen it yet. Like, it's just, it was so fun to me to realize how big of an impact a movie that's over 30 years old has still. So I just, yeah, yeah. I just wondered what it, how does that feel to know that your work still has, has that impact on us that we still want to share it with our kids. And like I said, I, I, I get this every weekend at comic cons because so many people, um, I mean, you, you don't realize the impact you have on people until you meet them and they tell you, you know, and it's like, for me, when I, you know, when I was growing up, the Jetsons was the first, I mean, the Flintstones was the first really situation comedy cartoon that was, you know, on in prime time. And uh, I can remember as a little kid, so I was probably about nine or 10 years old when that came out. And we had this little black and white TV downstairs and I would turn that on and I would sit there with my pad of paper. And every time Fred would turn a certain way, I'd draw as much as I could and wait until, because inevitably he'll turn and look sideways again. So then I'll, and that's how I learned how to draw Fred. And then the irony is that the very first drawing I ever did at Hanna-Barbera was Fred. <laughs> oh, how cool. So, so weird, you know, that I did that. And then I thought, so I got to work on the new Fred and Barney show. So I got to do Fred and Barney. And then when when the um, Jetson movie came up and somebody said, would you like to work on the Jetson movie? 
I'm like, oh my gosh, I never thought I'd get to work on the Jetsons. You know, the Flintstones were so popular that they went on forever. Mm -hmm. But the Jetsons kind of only was one season and kind of disappeared. It just, it just didn't catch on like the Flintstones right. did. And so when we did the movie, I, I just, again, same thing. I'm drawing George Jetson right here in this, and it's going to be on the big screen. It's not even going to be on TV. It's going to be on the movie theater screen. And uh, so that was just, you know, phenomenal for me to be able to, uh, to do that. And then a little bit later on, I worked mm -hmm. on in uh, Universal, Florida, there was a Hanna-Barbera ride. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of one of those... Um, Flight simulator rides where you're really not going anywhere, but you feel like you're mm -hmm. moving because the thing's moving around. And you would pull up in your little car or whatever it was, and Joe and and Bill would meet you and say, hey, welcome to Hanna-Barbera Ride. And we are here in the studio, and this is how we did a cartoon. So while the ride's going on for the other people, they're entertaining you until it's your time turn to go. And so Joe, hey, Joe, why don't you go over and draw a picture? So he'd go over to the desk and he drew Elroy. And then Elroy pops up off the paper and starts flying all around him. Hey, Mr. You know, Mr. Hannah. And, and then Dick Dastardly comes out of nowhere, grabs Elroy and kidnaps him. And now your ride begins and you're going through the Jetson world and oh. Bedrock and all of the mansions of Scooby-Doo. It's all done in 3D, so it looks awesome. I did all the Elroy of that opening sequence, and I had never seen it until I finally found it on YouTube. There's a whole bunch that show the entire ride, but they don't show the opening sequence, and I finally found one that showed the opening sequence. So I finally got to see my work. But, um, you know, those are just some of the things that, that uh, pop up you don't think about them, and next thing you know, you're smack dab in the middle of it again, and, and just uh, so glad you you did it, you know. And you know, thank you for loving the Jetson movie because it was uh, one of the good times. Yeah, we had it. We had it on VHS, and it was it was in the the rotation with me and my sister between that and Goofy movie. Like those were our yeah. two go tos. Were sure. <laughs> Solid definitely. Places. I know we we did the same thing. We played things over and over and over. I don't know why we watched the same film over and over and over, but we did, and we loved it. You know. And I think when we didn't have streaming and we we only had those limited choices, it was the yeah we're going to go with the the movie that we know that we love. And yeah, yeah I, exactly. I cannot, I cannot count the number of times we watched that movie, and I'm pretty sure my mom still has it on VHS. Like, I'm pretty sure she still got it. Yeah, a lot of times, con, I, I bring a couple copies on DVD, you know, and, and if somebody decides, you know, hey, I'd like to get that Jetson movie finally, and I'll sign it for them. So it's, it's, it's great. That's so cool. That's cool. All right, Tom, we have one final question for you, uh, because the rest of our questions have been so serious, we call this one our silly question. So, oh. Yeah. Uh, and we asked this question of our guests because we think it's a shame that as an adult, nobody asks us anymore. What's our favorite dinosaur? So Tom Cook, what's your favorite dinosaur? Come on, it's not even a question. Next question, please. <laughs> T-Rex. Tom, thank you so much for being on our show with us tonight. Where can our viewers and our listeners go to find out more about you and your work? Well, you can always follow me, like I said, on Facebook at uh, Tom Cook Animator. I usually pop up. You know, follow me, and if you want to be able to send me messages, just, you know, message me, and I'll message back. So you can, uh, I get a lot of uh, commissions and stuff like that for people that want to get something from me. Uh, they can't get out to the cons. And usually on my Facebook page, I use a couple weeks before, I'll announce where I'm going to be. And uh, that way they can kind of get ready to come and see me at the shows or whatever. And, I mean, I've had people, I had, I was in Phoenix one time, and, Somebody came from Alabama. They drove all the way from Alabama to Phoenix because not only was I there, the voice of Skeletor and the voice of she -Ra. Oh, so wow. He said, I've got to come to that. So they came all that way and got, you know, everything they had practically autographed uh, by all three of us. So, I mean, it, it's pretty amazing. And, 
So, and really that's, I don't do a lot of social media other than that. I'm on Instagram, but I don't really use it. Um, it's basically Facebook that I use and not really too much beyond uh, telling people what I'm going to be doing and when. Okay. Well, we will definitely link your Facebook so that they can go and find out which con is closest. Cause... Yeah, and anybody wants a commission, like I said, they can just message me and uh, tell me what they'd like. And, uh, you know, I could do something for them and uh, autograph it and everything for them. And, and it's it's really kind of cool. That Excellent. is really cool. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, I want to remind you that subscribing is the single most important thing you can do to help our show to continue to grow. And we get more amazing guests like Tom Cook here today. Uh, who's one of the variant, many variants of Tom Cook that you'll find out on the internet. Uh, but you have all these uh, awesome uh, opportunities to be able to listen to Tom and and and, and hear these stories. And, and yeah, it's just really cool. This has been a, a joy for me. So guys, please subscribe. It helps us well more than we can even begin to tell you. And go check out Tom on Facebook. He's got some cool stuff going there. And, and yeah, if you're a big fan of 80s animation like I am, uh, this is, yeah, it's definitely something you want to check out. And uh, if you can go check him out at a con, he's got a lot of cool stuff at his table. When we saw him at Monroe Pops, I wish I would have had more money there because there were some things that I need to get. So Tom and I will probably be talking soon. But if for whatever reason you are not happy with the content of our show today, please feel free to lodge a complaint with the head of our complaint department. His name is Skeletor. Skeletor is a little on edge to begin with because he's lost all of his face skin and the castle he wants to live in is lived in by a dude with hairy underoos. So take that into consideration when you submit your one single complaint form. There's no telling who will bear the brunt of his annoyance. Most likely, it's going to be us. And we know that. But it could be you. And once he's annoyed, well, you just can't tell. There's no facial muscles there. He can't give you a smile or a frown. But you will know if he pulls out the sword. <laughs> We're so doomed. <laughs> well, thanks so much, guys. This was a lot of fun. Uh, Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, I always enjoy doing this. So it, nice meeting you guys. And hopefully I'll see you at the, the next con I'm at. Uh, now in Monroe, I'm hoping I'll come back. It was a pretty good show. It was a lot of fun. Well, we hope People you were real nice. Yeah. yeah, they're a great group, group of people down there, for sure. Guys, yeah. take care. Yeah. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Sounds good. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for the FSF Popcast. Goodbye! Copyright 2023 FSF Popcast. Reference to any specific product or entity mentioned on this podcast does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by FSF Popcast. The views expressed by the guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact us via email at info at fsfpopcast.com. Original music by Jordan Michaels.